Hello everybody. Um, I wanted to do another philosophy video, uh, like the last one that I did about the matrix and technology and the, and the media. Uh, the only thing is, as much as some of you liked the philosophy video, uh, it did not get nearly as many clicks. And so I was kind of in a quandary, like I wanted to do another one because actually I enjoyed that the most too, but um, how to get more people to click on it. And so then I had, you know, a great idea I'll just talk about sex for an hour, but in a philosophical way. And so uh, that's what I'm going to do. Okay? And you'll find it interesting, I promise. So I'm going to be looking at these, these three uh, guys primarily today. Uh, Lacan, Bataille, and Sartre. Yes, I know I'm not saying Sartre exactly right, but I can't do that thing that the French do, like they've got a loogie or whatever, right, caught in their throat. So I'm not going to even try it, so you're going to have to deal with my incorrect pronunciation of Sartre. Um, but I want to talk about, so I want to talk about these, these really interesting philosophies, and we're going to start by not even talking about uh, sex, so you have to hold on for a second, but don't worry because in a little while I'll be talking about things that will make everyone uncomfortable. Okay, so uh, Lacan, this, uh, this French psychoanalyst, he lived in mid 20th century, mid 20th century, uh, psychoanalyst in that he was in the old uh, Freudian tradition, also a really interesting uh, philosopher, and uh, so just a brilliant guy. A lot of Americans have never heard of him, but he's really popular in South America for some reason. Uh, and then obviously, like, you know, if you're French, a lot of French, a lot of Europeans have heard of him. Uh, okay, so what's one of his most interesting theories? I want to start with this because this kind of will explain what's going on in a way when we, when we get into sexuality. Uh, so... When we are, and this is according to Lacan, so when we are born, when we are in an initial uh, infant state, okay, uh, we do not have a clear sense of ourselves as individualized human beings. In other words, we're just kind of this like blob. And yeah, we, we get hungry at times. We know there are these, these people that feed us or take care of us and we want, we want those basic things. But we don't, we're not at the point psychologically where we can understand that we are like this separate identity, this like separate being in the world, okay? Now, what Lacan says happens is that at a certain point in the child's development, usually around the age of, of like a toddler, somewhere around 12 to 18 months, he says that the child enters into what we can call uh, the mirror stage or the mirror phase, all right? And understand that what I'm about to tell you, it's kind of a metaphor. So yes, it can literally happen with a child looking at himself or herself in the mirror, but um, it, it also describes metaphorically a kind of a, a stage in human development. And of course, you know, my nose now starts running as soon as I start this. It's kind of cold in here, but... Uh, whatever, I might have to stop to grab a tissue. All right, so here's the thing with Lacan. So I'm gonna show, I'm gonna draw some stick figures because it's hard, it doesn't really make sense unless I show you what's going on. And these stick figures are horrible actually, but whatever. Okay, so the child looking at itself in the mirror, okay, for the first time. Now, it has, Lacan says, it has two important realizations when it, when it does this, when it sees itself in the mirror, okay? One is that for the first time, it recognizes in its image, it recognizes itself as this singular individual in the world, okay? In other words, it looks at itself and it's like, oh, that's, that's me, okay? And so for the first time, the child has a sense of itself as this singular individual person. Now, um, the child also has this secondary realization at the same time, and this is the more problematic or, or troubling realization, okay? The child, looking at itself in the mirror, suddenly realizes that just as, it, just as he or she sees this image of themselves, that also other people around them, right? And so, like, if I were going to do it with the stick figures here... Sorry. 
So there's the child looking at himself, herself, and then you've got the child suddenly realizes, oh, there are these other people that are looking at me too. And if you think about the significance of the mirror in particular, you know, why is it, generally speaking, that we look in the mirror? And, and generally, why, why are we doing it? It's usually because like we're, we're getting ready for work or something. We want to make sure, like before I did this video, I wanted to make sure that everything looked, you know, reasonably okay. And but when you think about it, when you're looking in the mirror, generally speaking, you're not looking for like yourself in that, like, do you really care just personally if a hair is like out of place or if something looks weird? Like if you were just going to be at home all day and never see anyone, you wouldn't care. So when you're looking in the mirror, and this is what the column was getting at, when you're looking in the mirror, you're looking to see what other people are seeing. You're trying to get into the, the mental space of another person. And so the realization that the child has when it sees itself in the mirror is that it realizes for the first time that it is now, it is an object of judgment and scrutiny for others. And, and so just, just like I can look at myself in the mirror and make all of these, uh, come to all of these conclusions, okay? So too can other people look at us. And, and so what happens is, is that this is kind of a foundational, this is very awkward what I'm doing here. This is kind of a, a foundational moment here where a kind of a split occurs early on in our development. It's kind of hard to see that, but a split early on occurs in our development between the self as experienced internally, like as we experience ourselves internally, like this is how I feel, this is how it feels being me, versus the self as experienced externally as an object. And so there's a split, an object for others. In other words, other people looking at, this, at, at other people in an, in an objectified way, which we all do. Okay. Anytime you look at someone and you think, oh, they look pretty or they don't, or, oh, that's a nice shirt they have on, or it's not, or, oh, they look kind of sloppy or whatever. These are all basically, this is that, this is that subject object split here. Okay. And this is a very sort of traumatizing and problematic stage in development. And we don't remember it. Okay. And here's the thing. It's the stuff that you don't remember, unfortunately, that shapes you the most. Uh, Freud was not alone. He, there, were, there are many other psychoanalysts and psychologists who believe, it, it's pretty much agreed, that the personality is more or less set by age five or six. And so it's the formative years, it's the years that you can't remember, it's the years when you were really young that basically have programmed you to be who you are. But that's a whole other subject. Where was I going with that? Oh, so this subject object split, right? Between the self internalized and the self objectified or exteriorized. This is an uncomfortable tension. This does not sit well within us psychologically. It is a cause and we, and, and again, we're talking at the level of the unconscious. We're not talking about something that maybe it even occurs to you very much. Okay. I mean, I've read about all this stuff a lot, so maybe I think about it more, but, um, it's a very uncomfortable tension. We don't like that. We don't like feeling like we're basically split all of the time, which we all are. Now, of course, some people have a more pathological issue with this. When we talk about narcissistic personality disorder and, and people who are like, you know, pathological liars and so forth, they're just experiencing basically a kind of a, a more of a, in a psychoanalytic sense, kind of more of a, a fracturing of the self. Okay. But again, something to talk about later. So we find this, we find this uncomfortable now, and this, this can be, uh, this can be made worse if there's an issue with the parent, particularly the cross-gendered parent. And what, what do I mean by that? I just mean like, if you're a girl in a, a psychoanalytic Freudian sense, you, like you tend to early in your development, you tend to fixate more on the father. So that's, you know, we talk about things like when Freud, you know, we talk about things like the electric complex or the girl getting hung up on these early experiences with her father and then repeating them later in life. So that's the way it is for the girl. For the guy, it's focused more on the mother. Now that doesn't mean that there's not tremendous influences from the, from the other parent, right? A lot of guys have big issues with their, their dads and women with their moms. Okay. But I'm just saying, if we're talking about, we're, I'm going to be talking about sexuality here. And so it tends to be, it tends to be the, the male child with the mom and the, the girl child with the dad. Okay. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that if there's something early on in the child's development 
where the um, the there's abuse or the love of the the parent is inconsistent or um, or they're absent or, or whatever, then that according to psychoanalysis that is a really really big deal because one of the things that we early on in our development get really hung up on I'm talking before we even have language we get really hung up on whether the parent is present or absent and uh, Lacan actually called this the game or was it Lacan or Freud but they called this the game of uh, of Fort Da or, or back and forth right and that the child even in normal circumstances has, has a great deal of anxiety about whether or not they really have their parents love and the reason for that is because our survival when we're young our survival depends on whether or not our parents love us whether or not they want to be around us um, you know all of those things how consistent they are in the expression of their love for us and so it's all it's something that is because they feed us right because they because you can't do anything for yourself when you're a kid and so instinctively instinctively you know that your very survival is tied to this person or these people so if early on in life especially there's an inconsistency in the expression of that love or an absence or anything then it really increases this anxiety that's already there about the subject object uh, split okay now you might be saying I thought you were gonna talk about sex I'm, I'm almost there um, again about five minutes everyone will be uncomfortable um, okay so so here's the thing the, where I'm going with this is that according to psychoanalysis one of the things and some existential philosophy one of the things that's happening on a psychological level when people are having sex is that you have a kind of a a kind of a, a transcending or disintegration of the subject object boundary I can't even see this I should have gotten a better marker but you have a kind of a a, a, a fucking with that line basically um, and so it's one of the things that people on a, in a deeper level are trying to get at with sex now I, I mean I understand there's the whole like biological and evolutionary and all of that it's all tied together right just different ways of looking at the same thing uh, and so that's that that explains that explains a lot and it, but it also explains why people have such conflicted sort of attitudes uh, with with sexuality or romantic relationships is because sexuality is basically it, it exists on a kind of a, a line on a kind of a zone of tension and that zone of tension between subject and object it's never it, it's never quite it's never quite worked out okay and it's just something that was just there forever if you're human um, now I'm, I'm trying to think how to, how to explain this next part um, and oh and you oh with the subject and object thing too this explains a lot too of why sexuality often is, is emphasizes so much the uh, the act of objectification or the idea of objectification so if you think about like the all of like the and, and i know the 50 shades of gray stuff is like silly it's a silly book I, I couldn't even read i read like two pages of it and i was like what is this uh it's just it's and i'm not like a snob about like it has to be well written but i mean th that book is just, mm -mm. but anyway but that what is up with that whole all of like the the s m and the bondage and the 50 shades of gray and, and whatever and, and even like the more extreme stuff where you know a lot of people are like what the fuck you know like we talked about in the marilyn manson videos um uh what is up with all that well because because sexuality in part is about playing with this line um between subject and object it tends to there tends to be this sort of like um fixation on the idea of objectification and there's nothing wrong with that i guess what i'm trying to say is i'm just trying to explain like what's going on there on a deeper level and why it seems that so many forms of popular sexuality seem to be presented in terms of really emphasizing that idea of objectification okay i hope this is making sense uh so next i want to talk about and here's the part that'll start to make people uncomfortable uh, so I want to talk about this guy named Bataille uh, it's another French guy and he was actually married to Lacan's wife so they were married to the same woman but at different times which I think is interesting that must have been a very interesting woman if both of these guys <laughs> wanted to marry her but um, 
anyway, so Bataille, a ph French philosopher, you know, like Lacan, French philosopher, mid 20th century France, and he was really into some weird things. I don't know how else to put it. He's one of my favorite writers. I really like him. What I, what I think is interesting is when you, when you talk about this, when you read it, a lot of it like really explains some things that already intuitively, like we already know, but then that's the beauty of philosophy of reading philosophy is you read something and you're like, oh, you know, that's, that's what I've always, that's what I've always thought or always felt. And now there's somebody like putting it into words, right? So even with the weird stuff like Bataille, you may not be able to identify with everything he's writing about, but he's getting at some, some truths about human nature and human sexuality. All right. Now, a little more about his biography. Um, he didn't just study sexuality. He was interested in um, all kinds of what he called transgressive practices across different cultures. So he would study things like uh, human sacrifice. Uh, he would study like things like incest and stuff like that. Uh, all kinds of stuff. And what he, he was what he was interested in was the notion of I'm just going to stop using the board because it's not working out. Just I'll just talk. Um, what he was interested in was the notion of transgression and taboo. And he was interested in the way in which uh, sexuality, so much of sexuality seems in various ways to be, um, to be coiled up with the appeal of transgression. And that even when you study like the writings of some of the great saints of Christianity, you know, like uh, like uh, Saint Augustine, who honestly it seems like when you study him was a sex addict, um, a founder. You know, like a great father of the church and everything. Uh, there's like stuff named after him, and but uh, he, yeah, he he had kind of a problem, I guess we could say. Uh, he had this famous quote. This is a really famous quote attributed to Saint Augustine, in one of his one of his writings actually, and he it went like this. It goes, uh, Lord, give me chastity, but not yet. <laughs> which is, I guess, is that an acceptable prayer? I don't know. Um, and so, okay, so anyway, St. Augustine, where am I going with that? Uh, even when you look like in the writings of, of some of the saints, like you find that they were really like obsessed with sex. And so, you know, Bataille looked at this and he found that, sorry, my nose is running again. I will stop in a minute if I have to. Um, he found he, he was interested in the fact that prohibition, okay, prohibition, like saying thou shalt not, okay, so prohibition is like no. So we're not just talking about prohibition like alcohol, okay, we're just talking about what the word to prohibit means to say thou shalt not do this, okay, this is wrong or whatever. And Bataille was interested in the way that prohibition actually creates the desire for transgression. So that instead of, and transgression meaning to like do something wrong, or to literally transgression means to, to cross the boundary, to transgress the boundary, all right? And, and so Bataille was interested in the way that it seems that, that prohibiting something actually counterintuitively intensifies or strengthens the transgressive aspect of it. And let me explain to you what I mean. Okay, let's just do a little exercise. Um, I want you for the next uh, 30 seconds to not think about what's something fairly benign that we could, okay, a, a pink elephant. I don't even know what you'd be thinking about that, but okay, let's pick that. So for the next 30 seconds, I want you to try to not think about a pink elephant. All right. Okay. I hope you're not thinking about a pink elephant because you're not supposed to think about a pink elephant. It would be really bad if you thought about a pink elephant. So you're not thinking about a pink elephant, are you? Okay, I hope not. You see what I'm getting at? So the more that you try to not think about something, it's this interesting thing that, <laughs> psycho that psychoanalytically happens. But the more that one tries to not think about something, then actually the more one has to think about it. Because in order to not think about something, you have to think about it first. Does that make sense? <laughs> I feel like I'm just probably just confusing lots of people with this, but maybe not. Maybe it'll work out. Uh, so it is, so that transfers into sexuality. And so what Bataille was interested in, in the way is, is the way that there are all of these prohibitions uh, in society about things that are considered to be wrong or things that are considered to be controversial or taboo even. 
and how you can understand those prohibitions as actually reinforcing the transgressive desire, the desire to go through the limit. So uh, he sees that sexuality exists on this, this uncomfortable binary between prohibition and transgression. And that is one reason, uh, he says, why so much, so much of what people find erotic is often wrapped up in that which is, that which is forbidden, uh, that which is seen as being you know, controversial, or even that which is seen as being disgusting. Okay, and so, and there is, Bataille, one of the things that Bataille was really interested in is the, the way that in sexuality, that running through sexuality is this very close relationship often between eroticism and disgust or repulsion. And many people understand the feeling of, of being attracted to something that you are also, that you are also in some way repulsed by. I mean, we even have, even if it's just at the level of like not liking someone, right? We have that, what's that whole, uh, that phrase, uh, hate sex, right? Well, that would be one example. But another example uh, would be uh, something like, well, for instance, so Freud had this notion he called the Madonna, he called it the Madonna whore complex. I talked about it a little bit in the uh, the Army Hammer video I did, although I took that video down. wasn't I didn't think it was very good. But uh, Freud, you know, he was practicing in uh, late Victorian Europe and, and then early 20th century Europe. And he noticed that a number of his male clients, um, who would, the, you know, some of these wealthy men who would come to him for psychoanalysis, he noticed that a number of them seemed to have this issue where they married women who were very kind of saint-like and motherly. That's where he gets the term Madonna from, like Madonna, like Virgin Mary, <laughs> not like the, the singer. Um, and anyway, so they would uh, they would marry these women who were very like uh, like proper, or virginal, or whatever, and then because be, and then because of this split in their sexuality between between two things that don't fit together, the they would marry these women who were very like sort of puritanical and they didn't really see in a sexual way so much, and so then while they're married to them, they would continue to see these prostitutes because that was their sexuality was split. There was no way to basically for these men to basically take these two ideals of a woman. And put them together it just, it just in some people's minds it just doesn't fit and so there is you know but i understood that there is in sexuality often uh, that a lot of eroticism and sexuality rests on things that are not necessarily like on a split that's not necessarily a comfortable place it's a place of tension and that's why so many people tend to be fractured in their experience uh, of sexuality and compartmentalize it and, and that sort of thing you know what i'm talking about i don't even have to really give examples um, now, Bataille was also interested in the way that, um, that sexuality, that there's this dichotomy in sexuality, um, how do I want to say this, between, well, that sexuality is fundamentally a basic biological and even kind of grotesque thing in the sense that I tell you what, here's a quote. So Bataille writes about uh, St. Augustine, uh, St. Augustine in, his, uh, in his, one of his books, and he talks about this famous quote from St. Augustine. Uh, remember, the church father was a sex addict. And uh, St. Augustine wrote, uh, we are born, I don't remember the Latin, but St. Augustine wrote, uh, we are born between feces and urine. And this this notion and he's talking about the anatomy of things he's talking about like the anatomy of your mother like where you came from right and if you think about initially how you popped out in this world and how things are situated anatomically that's what he means when he says we're born between we're born between shit and urine okay and so our the very idea of reproduction and also well the other thing too that that um bataille noted and St. Augustine as well, is that, <laughs> see if I get the quote right, the body's sexual organs are also the body's sewers. The body's sexual organs are also the body's sewers. And so if you think about the fact that the sex organs also have, uh, in various ways, ex excretory functions, right? then there is in sexuality this, un again, this sort of uneasy mix of things that we find uh, very biologically grotesque. And yet, because reproduction is, is 
inextricably intertwined from the beginning with these things, even just locationally speaking, okay? Uh, that to a degree, sexuality, to some, to some degree or other, it remains sort of tethered or fixated to uh, this sort of baser biological thing. And so Bataille said that that's why you, you find uh, people with fixations, and I'm, I'm not like judging it, he wasn't either, <laughs> believe me, um, but why you find like people with like fixations uh, that they consider to be like dirty fixations on things like you know anal sex or excrement or you know or people who are into like menstrual blood or whatever. I told you I'd make you uncomfortable, right? Um, I'm not uncomfortable. You're uncomfortable, but no, I'm kidding. Uh, so anyway, but that's like what is up with all that? And 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 so that's you know. But I said that we would we would be much better off if we could come to terms psychologically with the root of some of our our sexual behaviors or our fixations or, or whatever you want to call them right and but instead what tends to happen with with most everybody like we're all like this to some degree is that we go through life really not having a clue of why we're really doing things like we have these reasons of like why we think we're doing things but why we think we're doing things often is a lie that our psyche is unconsciously telling us to keep us moving in that direction. Because our psyche, again, exists on a, a, its own kind of uneasy fracture between want the desire to, um, to do well in life and move forward in life and all of that, and also the desire to destroy oneself. Freud, uh, some, some Freudians call it the death drive. So uh, the point that I'm making is that we are deeply irrational human beings. This is one of the founding ideas of psychoanalysis, right? And early, early like Freudian thought, is we are deeply irrational beings, and we try to we try to explain why we do things, but we don't really know why we're doing what we're doing. And that's one of the points. That's the main point of like learning about oneself, of psychoanalysis, of therapy if it's done right, and um, and and just and just thinking about the world, being self-aware, is that hopefully you can come to terms with what you're doing and why you're doing it a little better, right? Nobody ever really gets, nobody ever really gets uh, the kind of self-insight that we wish we had. But, you know, an interesting metaphor that Freud used um, is that of the iceberg. And Freud said that, you know, just like when you look at the iceberg, when you look at it, you see the part that's sticking up over the water right? What you don't see is what is beneath the water, which is actually the much larger and more significant uh, part of the iceberg. And so Freud said that was very much, that's what the psyche is. Um, we see just the, the top, the obvious superficial aspects of our behavior and our conscious explanations for why we do what we do. But really what is, what remains underwater, what remains submerged, even to us, even to ourselves, is really what's going on with us because we um, because so much of our behavior is at the unconscious level, uh, even in a biological sense. Like, are you making yourself breathe right now? Are you making your heart beat? Are you doing any of these things? No. Well, Freud would say, and, and others like Lacan and Bataille would say that just like you're not aware of making your heart beat, you also are not aware of what's really going on in your head. And so we like to think we're aware, but we're just like basically like clueless. It's really kind of cynical in a way, uh, but it's interesting. Um, so what else? And, and so, well, let me just say that when we think about this idea uh, that Bataille was into of transgression, it's why Bataille was, was so interested in his life in studying like all kinds of practices that are considered to be taboo or transgressive. And so he was really interested in things like, I mean, just all kinds of different sexual practices and orgies and, and um, definitely, you know, like S&M and all of that. He also um, published uh, some pornography. I, I don't think that, I think it was banned. I'd have to look that up, but I'm talking about written pornography. Um, but he was interested in all of these different like transgressive uh, practices and things that were at the periphery of human experience. And he was really influential for uh, one of my favorite horror writers, uh, a guy named uh, Clive Barker. I don't know if you've ever seen any of the movies. Some of his are better than others, honestly. Uh, it's hard to do a good horror film, uh, but especially on a low budget. 
Uh, but uh, he's he's done like the Hellraiser, the first Hellraiser movie and stuff like that. But his writing is really interesting. Um, at one point, he was he was like considered to be like the next Stephen King, but it's very much tied to like the dark side of sexuality and very much. Uh, Clive Barker is very much invested in putting themes of sexuality up against uh, themes of death, and so you often find these characters in his. Um, in his works who are very like highly sexualized but are also like 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 killers and things like like that or like bound to satan and stuff he's in all this dark stuff but my point is is that um he was very inspired by bataille you know one of uh, one of the other themes that bataille was really interested in is um the the way that even like sex and death in our society are bound up together I, probably a number of you know that the French term for orgasm is it translates to the, the little death, right? Uh, le petit uh, mort, uh, the little death. And, you know, if you see, like, if you watch horror movies, there's always a, often a real emphasis on sexuality, even running alongside the idea of death and murder and, and mayhem and all of that. And so if you think about, like, the teen slasher film, like the, you know, especially the ones from, like, the, the 80s, uh, where you have like the kids, like all like the teenagers having sex, and then they get killed off, and like the only one who's left is the virgin and stuff. So there's this interest, there's this thing, you know, this kind of obsession with sexuality that you find running through uh, horror films and stuff like that. And so Bataille would say again that um, one of the uneasy, uncomfortable paradoxes of life is how death is running alongside life. And so when we think about life, or we think about reproduction, or whatever. We don't tend to think about it in terms of the, the, the fact that it is undergirded by death. And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, what, if, you, if you're planting a garden, okay, and you want to fertilize that garden, what do you get to fertilize it? Well, you get compost. And so it'll be, it'll either be a like dead plant material or it'll be, it'll, you know, it'll be about, um, about like manure, right, that's used for composting. But my point is, is that life creates death but death also creates life and to look at to look at our world you can see the kind of this the cycle the sort of mysterious cycle that occurs with with birth uh, or with life and death and so when Bataille, when saint augustine says we are born between feces and urine he's also saying he's not only looking at the sexual aspect of it but he's also saying that out of shit comes life, out of death comes life, okay, that in, in a metaphorical sense, okay? And so again, what I'm trying to explain is why in, in you see like in, in, the sex, in, in some expressions of sexuality and certain fetishes and things that we, contend, that we tend to contend, uh, consider more transgressive, they're, they're often so wrapped up with some of this other stuff, with the grotesque or with the repulsive or with the biological and, and, and all of that. And again, it's not like, it's not anything to make anybody feel bad about, right? It's, the point is, this is kind of all of us. And um, Bataille would say, and Freud would say that everybody is walking around with different um, irrational fixations, uh, uh, both sexual and otherwise, and all kinds of things that they're trying to work out at the unconscious level. All right. Okay, now I want to read a little bit. I have got, I've got some Bataille here, actually. And if I remember to, I'll try to put this up on the screen so you can read along with me. But I just want to look at a bit of the actual text because the writing is really interesting. It's difficult uh, in places because it's antiquated and it's written by a philosopher. Um, but it's interesting. So he's talking, about, he's talking about this split in sexuality, okay? Between the civilized self and the civilized society and the basic, uh, irrational, even violent, animalistic state that is sexuality, okay? He writes, Only the actual experience of states of normal sexual activity and the clash between them and socially approved conduct allows us to recognize that this activity has its inhuman side. This activity has its inhuman side. He's, he's saying, basically, that you can see in sexuality, you can see how it is, in a way, it is divorced from normal, rational, civilized human behavior. He says here, continuing on, he says, the organ's plethora induces reactions alien to the normal run of human behavior, 
A rush of blood, literally, upsets the balance on which life is based. A madness suddenly takes possession of a person. That madness is well known to us, but we can easily picture the surprise of anyone who did not know about it and who by some device witnessed unseen the passionate lovemaking of some woman who had struck him as particularly distinguished. He would think she was sick, just as mad dogs are sick. What is he saying there? Well, <laughs> it's kind of amusing, I guess an amusing thought. It's almost like if, uh, if, if you were talking to an alien who had no idea like what sex was, never seen it, whatever, and you were to show that alien like this sort of this normal, say this normal person going about their normal day acting in a, you know, socially prescribed civilized manner. And then you were to show the, the alien that person having sex, it's going to look, Bataille says, inhuman. It's, it looks, it will look, he says, you look at a woman having, if you were to look at a woman having sex, you would think she is sick as a mad dog is sick. And so the fact that sexuality is, on the one hand, it is something that, you know, pretty much almost everyone experiences in, in some way. And yet, on the other hand, it is something that really does not fit in nicely with the rest of our socially circumscribed our, our, our lives and with civilization and everything, right? And that's why it's often so difficult to apply legal codes and, and official, like, bureaucratic systems to sexuality. Like, you know, college universities trying to adjudicate what happened between two drunk students at 1 a.m. in the morning based on a murky he, sh he said, she said scenario. I mean, what Bataille would say is, you fools, you are in the realm of the irrational and the animal, and you're trying to tease out, you're trying to tease out civilized bureaucratic codes from, from something that is inhuman and, and, and irrational and animalistic, which is not to say that we shouldn't have laws against rape or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. I hope you can understand the, the, the distinctions. I mean, it takes, it takes some nuance of thinking to understand some of the stuff that I'm trying to explain here. Uh, this is not this is not binary, you know, black and white, right and wrong. We're we're way beyond that realm. When we get into the realm of like deep psychoanalysis, we go beyond in a way. We go beyond right and wrong. Although certainly, as I said earlier, we get into the we get into scenarios of of prohibition and transgression. All right, it's just a certain way of looking at the world. It's not for everyone. So Bataille continues. He says. Um, hmm. He says, uh, this mostly, talking about sexuality, this mostly adds up to a sense of transgression dangerous to the general stability and the conservation of life. And without it, the instincts could not run their course unhindered. Now, what he's saying is that the transgressive aspect of sexuality, as I've said earlier, it doesn't really fit in very neatly with other civilized, with our civilized uh, lives and social structures and all that. Then he says, this is the interesting thing. He says, but transgression is not only objectively necessary to this freedom, meaning to sexual freedom, for it can happen that unless, this is the, this is the, big, this is the point here, for it can happen that unless we see that transgression is taking place, we can no longer have the feeling of freedom that the full accomplishment of the sexual act demands, so much so that a scabrous situation is sometimes necessary to a blasé individual for him to reach the peak of enjoyment, or if not the situation itself, an imaginary one lived out like a daydream during intercourse. What is he saying? He's saying that uh, a, a lot of sexuality especially when we get, we get really like deep into the muck of people's like fantasies and internal, internal sexuality. Um, it is, it is, it, it, it almost requires transgression. That's why so much of it is like things that, that people like that are like not socially um, condoned or why there is such a divorce between like what you find in sort of official society and then what you find in various forms of, of ex sexual expression like pornography and stuff. Why, it's, why does it seem there is such a split? And that's what he's trying to say. He's saying that there's something about transgression. Or if you think about it at the level of like 
uh, someone having an affair and part of the attraction of that is is the act of doing something wrong, the act of crossing a line that is not meant to be crossed or like situations where therapists have sex with their clients, which happens actually a lot. I'm not speaking from personal experience here, but I'm just saying that there have been studies that have been done and a fairly significant number of um, therapists are their clients. Uh, anyway, and why and why? Because there's such a <laughs> there's such a. a a, a line drawn against it, right? It's like the thing that you're not supposed to do if you're a therapist. And so then what do therapists do? I mean, some of them, not all, <laughs> but some, don't get mad at me if you're a therapist, please. Okay. I'm not saying everybody's doing it or whatever. I'm just saying that if you look at the studies, it's not an insignificant number. Okay. All right. Now let's keep going. Let's get even more, God, get even, get me into even more trouble here. He says, he writes, um, such a situation is not always a terrifying one. Many women cannot reach their climax without pretending to themselves that they are being raped. But deep within the significant break, there dwells a boundless violence. So, you know, it's not very PC to say, but if we're thinking about something like the, the Fifty Shades of Grey scenario or just things just on the level of like rape fantasies, which they are common and make people uncomfortable or whatever. But the, if you read if you read the studies that have been done on human sexuality, this this is one of the big ones. And what is he saying here? He's not saying that that women with this fantasy literally want to be assaulted. He's, he's talking about the fact that people, that sexuality uh, is, can be so hooked into the idea of transgression that people have to feel like uh, that, that there's this idea of like having to feel like you're doing something wrong. And so it could be, it could be the idea of like fantasizing about like fictional assault or simulating assault, or it could be, it could be any of the other behaviors and fixations and fetishes that we know that, that people get into. Okay. And then he says, at the very end of that, he says, deep within this, there is a boundless violence. And this is one of the things that does make people so uncomfortable because it doesn't fit in well it, with modern notions of sexuality. But he's saying that there is something inherently violent about the sex act. And I mean, if you were, if you didn't know, you know, going back to this idea of like the alien, like if you didn't know what you were looking at, you would think that like someone was like violently hurting someone. And I mean, there is, and people do get hurt <laughs> in certain scenarios, right? Um, but the point being that, that he, again, what he's pointing out, he's not saying that we shouldn't have laws against rape or, or whatever. He's just pointing out that we, that sexuality is a deeply irrational, deeply often transgressive thing and so much of it is going on at the level of that is beneath our understanding even but that there is this kind of like animalistic basic violent aspect and of course we know that we know that but at the same time it's interesting to read someone talk about it in a very analytical way anyway i want to wrap up by talking about sartre okay now sartre is not the only person to discuss what i'm going to get into here uh, but he's i think that he wrote about it in the most interesting way but you can find this in some of the other existential uh, philosophers all right now sartre was interested in the um, oh another french guy right sartre was interested in the relationship between the self what he what he and other philosophers termed the self and the other and so the other is anyone who is not you. So like everyone in the world is an other for me, right? For myself. And so the self other dichotomy, according to Sartre and others, is again, a split or a dichotomy that is fraught with a lot of um, conflicting emotions, and co conflicting feelings, uh, many unconscious. Okay. And this is what Sartre said. He said that when, when it comes to uh, relationships with others, and this actually, this applies to every relationship in your life, not just uh, sexual, not just romantic relationships, but it is, it is especially true in romantic relationships uh, and sexual relationships because of certain factors that make it more intense. But in all of your relationships, you are basically caught in a kind of a bind, Sartre says, because on the one hand, you want to have intimacy with other people. Like you want to have a deep romantic relationship or you want to have good friendships or you want to be close to your parents or whatever, right? 
And so on the one hand, there is the desire between the self and the other for, um, for harmony, okay, and for a crossing of the boundaries, for a kind of a losing of the self. And so in sexuality, in romantic relationships, but also in friendships or whatever, there is a desire for communion, a desire for the line between self and other to dissolve. And so that's one of the things that gets played out in sexuality and in actually the act of sex is the literal like physical crossing of the line right and literally penetration uh, but also that that is standing in for something deeper at the the psychological level which is what we're talking about here now if there were just the desire for communion then it would be simple but the problem is that we not only want to commune with others and to dissolve those boundaries, but at the same time, we want to run away from other people and we want to maintain the boundaries because we understand that anytime there is a disillusion or, um, or a lessening of the boundary between self and other, we lose some of ourselves. We, we lose some of our freedom. We lose some of our identity, whatever you want to call it. And you might say, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, just think about it in any relationship especially a close relationship, there is always a kind of a push-pull going on uh, between the will of the one person and the will of the other. And it could just be at the basic level of like you're, you're living with a roommate and you have a fight over like how often to wash dishes or, or you have a fight over politics or whatever. But at the level of a romantic relationship, especially this like dual sort of attraction repulsion thing, uh, especially in some individuals, can be actually pretty problematic. Uh, and so you can look at certain people and you can sort of see like the way that their lives are playing out, that there is this like, at the heart of it is this sort of push-pull or contradiction between the desire to be one with someone, but also to get the fuck away from them, right? And so that is the bind that we all find ourselves in, whether we're healthy or unhealthy psychologically, or we have good relationships or we don't, is that we want to be our own person. We want to be free. And when you are intertwined with somebody um, emotionally, sexually, whatever, you're not free, right? And so, but at the same time, we don't want to be completely free because that's like lonely and boring. <laughs> so we are pretty fucked. And I guess that is maybe a good place to stop things on that note. So uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I could make a lot more like this. I could talk about this stuff. I mean, if I could sit here for hours and just talk about this stuff, but I don't know, you know, if, if you want me to do that or not, or you like the other stuff better, I don't know. So let me know in your comments, are there other topics in philosophy that you'd like me to get into? Are there other topics related to sex in philosophy? Because I've just like only scratched the surface for what I have time to do today. So anyway, let me know in the comments. Um, feel free as always to tip uh, or find me on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And I have got more stuff coming out. I've got a lot coming out soon. I'm kind of making myself crazy actually trying to work on so many things. So this all may not end well, but we'll see. All right. Have a good, have a good day. Bye-bye.